second time. Right, there we go. We're now recording. Well reminded. So, so let us begin with prayer and let's use the Advent Collect to pray. Almighty God, give us grace to put away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day, when he shall come in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, hell is the topic for this evening. So, what has happened to hell? It has really gone out of fashion. Damnation is very difficult to come by. Now, it seems it is uh, regularly simply a source of amusement, which I think should probably raise some self-questioning. Why do we feel it's necessary to joke our way out of the subject? In contrast to hell, rising up the popularity charts is universalism, the idea that everyone is finally saved and enters the kingdom of God. And you can see why things might go this way. Starting from the biblical principle, God is love, it's not difficult to draw the conclusion that God will save everyone. And this is an abbreviated version of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave everyone eternal life, which, of course, is not quite what John 3.16 says. Some people today assume that God is ethically obliged to, to provide not only of equality of opportunity, but equality of outcome too. God's job is to get everyone to the heavenly finishing line. Otherwise, it's not humanity, but God who has failed. We are, says the universalist David Bentley Hart, by and large, all universalists now in practice, if not in theory. After all, he says, if we really thought our situation in this world was horribly perilous, that every mortal soul laboured under the shadow of an eternity of endless agony, and that the stakes were so high, then he says, we wouldn't be sitting here listening to the Bishop of Dunwich. No, we'd be out there out there, begging our loved ones to embrace Jesus, driven ceaselessly, ceaselessly around the world in a desperate frenzy of evangelism, seeking to save as many as possible from the million-year fire that was coming. Surely, Hart says, if we thought hell was coming, we would not conduct ourselves with the laissez-faire religiosity and indifference we tend to show to our loved one's prospects. Even the Pope is hinting at universalism these days, saying no one can be condemned forever because that is not the logic of the gospel. On the other hand, it is a bit disturbing to think from a universalistic perspective that thieves, rapists and murderers can carry on resting assured of their place in heaven. Death itself, it seems, can be the saviour in freeing everyone from all the consequences of their previous actions. But can we really get away with anything? Is that just? Is that morally right? Is that how God is? Well, the universalists argue this is the best option, given the other two main options in scripture appear to be 
everlasting punishment or the annihilation of sinners. Surely, says the Universalist, the God of love and grace would obviously draw everyone to the heavenly city, wouldn't he? But while arguments for everyone being saved go back to ancient church fathers and mothers, it has, until now, only been a minority position. And it turns out that there are some theological problems with getting rid of hell. And we'll come back to universalism presently, but let's just have a look at what scripture says. And let's start with Jesus, who appears to mention hell and its metaphors no more than anybody else in the New Testament. So much so that some felt that this cast doubt on Jesus' character. For instance, the atheist Bertrand Russell, who says this, there is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. So what does Jesus say? Well, according to the gospel and the gospels, some of the following things. Jesus repeatedly warns of refusing God's offer of grace and the peril of delaying one's response. And more widely, there are throughout the Old Testament and New Testament rehearsals of God's judgment on those who reject the way of repentance and spurn God's mercy. Here's a selection on this slide and don't worry if you, I can let you have the slides, all the slides will be available on the website uh, presently, so, uh, but this is simply to show you a selection of um, what Jesus says. And indeed um, more such as this as well. All of which begins to seriously challenge the assumption that Jesus is simply meek and mild and all about love and grace. Now, some people argue that what you see here in terms of what Jesus is saying, this is actually a rhetorical device, the use of oriental exaggeration for effect. It is exaggeration. Familiar, some of people say, to the culture of Jesus' time. So, for example, when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 22, if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the hell of fire. They say, Jesus is just trying to get our attention. He's effectively saying, look team, the issue of doing what I say is serious, all right? But the argument comes back against that, that at the least this sounds like Jesus is being manipulative, if not dishonest in motivating people by warnings that are not truthful information about their prospects if they fail to heed his teachings. So is Jesus uttering empty threats? Some, like the Roman Catholic theologian Karl Rahner, argue that the purpose of Jesus' threat language is not to point towards future outcomes, but rather to provoke individuals who encounter such language to reflect on themselves and reconsider their overall direction in life. It is meant to chase some people, to turn them around. But others, such as Jonathan Edwards, point out, if God in Jesus absolutely threatens, contrary to what he knows will come to pass, then he's absolutely threatening, contrary to what he knows to be the truth. So if God in scripture speaks what God knows to be untrue in declaring, promising or threatening, surely the authority of scripture is undone. To which the response comes back, well, Jesus' audience knew when Jesus was speaking rhetorically, metaphorically, 
and elusively. So you can see there are very different understandings of understanding the spirit of Jesus' teaching here on hell. And I'm afraid the difficulties don't end there, because much more widely, there are two sets of quite different language in the New Testament. One set of scriptures supporting universalism, that everybody will be saved. The other set, very much not so. First, here's a selection of those uh, texts supporting universalism. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all, and so on for all. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all. To read this selection of texts, you would think, aha, clinched. Everybody will be saved. And then there are the other set of texts, which actually support the opposite. But by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Sudden destruction will come upon them and there will be no escape and so on. And as I say, this is just a selection. So what are we to do? What are we to do with all this? Well, one approach is to tone down all the passages that speak about hell and destruction and emphasize the texts that speak of all being saved. This is what David Bentley Hart does in his book, That All Shall Be Saved, a recent volume. On the other hand, Christopher Morgan and Robert Peterson in their book, Hell Under Fire, do the opposite. They tone down the all will be saved passages and dial up the volume on the hell passages. The irony is that both sets of scholars are using exactly the same method to come to diametrically opposed conclusions. So I have to say I'm unimpressed with this method, which essentially distorts large slabs of scripture to get their way. So what shall we do then? Well, we aren't the first to stumble across this challenge. And through history, there have been a variety of views. So let's just take a closer look at the three main perspectives on hell taken through Christian history before I inform you of the Church of England's view, just in case you don't know it, and then hazard uh, a suggestion myself and then we'll have a discussion. So, three ways of looking at this. Eternal punishment, annihilation, which is the view that at some point in time the wicked will cease to exist, and universalism, the view that all will be saved. They were all around in the early church, and they competed. Augustine, argued for eternal punishment. Irenaeus went for annihilation of the unrighteous, while Gregory of Nyssa was among a very few that championed the salvation of all. And if you ask, well, where are we today in terms of the majority of the church? Well, uh, eternal punishment has the support of the Roman Catholic Church. This is a quote taken from the Catechism. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God, in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. Forgive the sexist language, that, that's how it's written. And that's the official Roman Catholic view, despite what Pope Francis said, as I quoted earlier, and indeed that of most Pentecostal churches. Eternal punishment is also the position of the Orthodox Church, the Eastern churches. Uh, but very interestingly, uh, the Orthodox believe that the afterlife is a spectrum between supreme and sublime enjoyment of God and the supreme torture of his presence, depending on our character. 
our state of uh, our state of being, our state of sanctification, how far we've come on the Christian way, essentially decides where we fall on this spectrum. The saints enjoy God and will increasingly enjoy God. Those who have not repented experience sufferings which are liable to increase apart from the prayers of the church. And those who are faithless for the orthodox are eternally damned because they cannot change their way of thinking. So you can see from this uh, uh, huge numbers of uh, the contemporary church have an understanding of hell as um, that which endures for eternity. And as I say, there are some weighty theologians behind hell as eternal punishment. St. Augustine taught unending physical torment, um, pain perpetually afflicting but never destroying the unhappy sinners. A state, Augustine says in scripture, is the second death of revelation. Thomas Aquinas followed suit, and among reformers, John Calvin cited the outer darkness, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth, inextinguishable fire, and the ever gnawing worm that he found in various parts of scripture. All of which sounds very grim. And we should note that actually very little of St. Augustine, very little of St. Thomas Aquinas, and very little of John Calvin is actually spent on such matters. Indeed, some commentators argue that in places, Augustine looks as if he hopes for the salvation of all, Calvin waxes lyrical about our beauty and brilliance as God's handiwork. Nevertheless, in the hands of some artists and some writers and theologians, the ideal of eternal punishment is nothing if not a vehicle for the expression of sadistic tendencies, and that has burned itself into our collective and individual psyches, which is perhaps why we wonder how a God of love could have any truck with such a possibility. Now, we, ca we can't delve too deeply into any one position, but, but a few comments are worth making about this position, the idea of hell as eternal punishment. If we come back and have another look at Jesus on this, those who argue that uh, Jesus is asserting eternal punishment derive most of their references from the parables of Jesus particularly the sheep and the goats and the rich man and Lazarus. And one of the questions uh, or one of the challenges against this position is whether really when Jesus is uttering these parables, he's really describing an eternal post-mortem state or merely using this as a backdrop to the parables. Are they primarily about practical calls to accountability and responsibility rather than descriptions of post-mortem conditions? Many scholars have doubted whether we can draw conclusions from parables that are so clearly symbolic and metaphorical in their storytelling. Indeed, the rich man and Lazarus, where you'll remember uh, when he dies, the rich man is separated by a great gulf in Hades from Lazarus, who is uh, at the bosom of the Heavenly Father. That story appears to be based on a well-established Near Eastern folktale of which there were several versions around, but whose main concerns were greed, selfishness and pride rather than the mechanics of heaven and hell. So it, it's debatable. But what does seem to be indicated in Jesus' teaching is the prospect and possibility of exclusion from the kingdom of God. Indeed, in Matthew 7, Jesus says he will declare to those who did not do the will of the Father, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. And when Jesus in Luke 13 is specifically asked, Lord, will only a few be saved? He doesn't answer directly, but he responds, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. The rest of that passage shows Jesus is speaking here of the kingdom of God. 
and his description of weeping and gnashing of teeth is an image of remorse rather than agony, while standing at the closed door is a wistful and sorrowful image rather than a tortuous picture. Again, the parable of the talents and the servant who received one talent appears to have as its main thrust that if a person is unwilling to take responsibility, that person is in danger of depriving themselves of the opportunity of the kingdom. Uh, one more thing about Jesus' teaching on this. Uh, a close reading of the relevant gospel texts suggests that his more specific warnings about hell are directed at his own disciples rather than the unredeemed, which might suggest that Jesus is motivating followers to evangelize the lost, that it is safer for the evangelist to have hell on his heart, as it were, rather than on his lips. Or as C.S. Lewis suggests here in this quote, this is not about your wife or your son or about Nero or Judas, Judas Iscariot. It's about you and me. Now, there are various problems with the idea of everlasting torment, and I'm sure some of them are already going around in your brain. It rather makes God look like a sinister parent with treats of all kinds in the living room and a torture chamber in the basement. Such a picture inevitably leads us to question the very definition of God as love. And can we really love a God who has everlasting torture as a possible final destiny for any of his creatures? Could such a God be Christianity's infinitely good God of love? So a split personality in God, a God of love. And then thirdly, is it possible that a rational creature could forever hold out against the infinitely good God of love? Why on earth would you want to damn yourself? So there remain some big questions for the idea of eternal torment as um, what hell is about. But I'm afraid there are also big questions for the other two as well. So let's take them one by one. Next, annihilation, which is the erasing of being. Sorry, there aren't too many jokes in this session, um, but, um, you know, it's just unremitting, really, I'm afraid. But it is the nature of the topic. Um, here, the understanding of Irenaeus was that hell is not eternal torment, but the final and irrevocable choosing of that which is opposed to God, opposed so completely and so absolutely that the only end is total non-being. If you cut yourself off from the source of life, guess what? Eventually you disappear. Now, the idea of annihilation relates to how long punishment will last if there is punishment. There are, as I've already mentioned, examples of ongoing punishment, such as the parable of the sheep and the goats and the rich man and Lazarus. Nevertheless, the annihilationists argue for sheer destruction rather than ongoing punishment. And they have a whole series of texts that they can quote to this effect. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. The suggestion being that you will perish otherwise. Or 1 Thessalonians, sudden destruction will come upon them and there will be no escape. Philippians 3.19, their end is destruction, i.e. not everlasting torment. Their end is destruction. So one of the disputed texts is um, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. These will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Now, um, if destruction is eternal, it could be forever destroyed or going on being forever destroyed. Or it could mean destroyed and eternally that is the case, if you see what I mean. So it could be used. It, it depends which way you want to read it. But most annihilationists hold that the unsaved will be destroyed soon after the general resurrection and adverse final judgment or following a more protracted period 
of divine judgment. Again, this is a pretty grim prospect. And uh, some draw back from it, feeling that uh, this cannot be the way of the God of love. So one person uh, very famously who drew back from this was uh, an evangelical called John Stott, who um, wrote this in that book, Evangelical Essentials, in the 1980s. Emotionally, I find the concept of eternal conscious torment intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. And as a result, he argued for annihilation. Whereas the Evangelical Alliance uh, go for eternal punishment. Now, annihilation is also criticized from both of the other positions. So on the one hand, Anthony Thistleton, who argues for everlasting torment, rejects annihilation because he says they belittle all those far too many passages that speak unambiguously of a continuing state for those who have rejected Jesus. And on the other hand, from a universalist perspective, Thomas Allen and others say that annihilation, just like eternal punishment, undermines the doctrine of the love of God. If God loves us more than a mother loves her child, then can God really be in the business of erasing, erasing wayward children from the face of the cosmos forever? So, to the third and final uh, one from the, the, the history of Christianity, universalism. Now let me look at this and raise some questions about universalism <clears throat> in terms of uh, David Bentley Hart's recent book. The strengths of universalism, universalism are pretty obvious in terms of uh, affording a fairly straightforward reading of God, the God of love. Um, but what about the weaknesses? And the most obvious challenges, it seems to me, are fourfold, and they are these. First of all, obviously, scripture. Many will be perplexed, if not astonished, by, for instance, the way David Bentley Hart handles scripture and other universalists do. He highlights the universalist texts and explains away or doesn't mention the others. When he finds reference to salvation for all, he does not pause to consider whether that's all the faithful or all the people of God, but always for Hart, it is all without exception. And Hart is but one of many universalists who have a selective approach to scriptural interpretation. Common among recent authors has been the approach that determines the main lens through the main message of scripture through the lens of Jesus. The argument runs that Jesus is loving, merciful, forgiving, etc. And so obviously God will save everyone because God is like Jesus. And versions of this are seen from Rob Bell to Richard Raw. Uh, and there appears to be a willingness to jettison the Old Testament, uh, the book of Revelation, anything in the New Testament that disagrees, including Jesus' words. And it's a bit tricky, as I've said, jettisoning Jesus, who rather awkwardly, as we have seen, says quite a bit about Gehenna and judgment. And again, awkwardly, talks more about hell than anyone else in the New Testament. So the question of scripture is a live one for the universalist. Secondly, human freedom. Hart, in his reasoning, presumes God will make sure that everyone at some point chooses the good and attains to heaven. This is because for Hart, when you read him carefully, freedom consists in following our rational nature. And as rational, reasoning and reasonable human beings, we will eventually, of course, choose the right path in the end, the path that results in our flourishing and joy. Hart argues that as rational beings, we must, in the end, love the good, the true and the beautiful, and that we are not able to not love the good in the end. We are made to love God. We must love God. We will love God. If we don't love God, we cease to be a rational being, which Hart says is impossible. 
But tradition, experience and large parts of scripture, however, say by contrast, yes, we're made to love God. We may love God, but we might not ever love God. And if we don't, we don't cease to be rational beings. We simply cease to be rational beings at peace. And Hart doesn't like this version of human freedom, but Jesus does seem to testify to it. As, for example, in John 5, when he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they testify to me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. There and elsewhere, Jesus suggests we do not act rationally, a fact we all know from experience. It is not at all clear that we are the kind of beings that Hart suggests. Indeed, we often act contrary to what we know is and will be good for us and others. The third question uh, for, for Hart is about grace. The irony is that in the attempt to underline God's gracefulness, universalism is in danger of losing God's grace. God in his grace stoops down to us and enables us to move towards him in and through Jesus Christ. It is a gift, unmerited, undeserved and unanticipated. But for heart, we essentially have the view, I am saved because I am human. Our rationality inexorably moving us towards the heavenly realm. In which case, the critics ask, why does Jesus bother with the Sermon on the Mount? Why does Jesus bother to cheat, teach? Why does Jesus bother to die and rise and even live? Why does the Holy Spirit bother to assist us? And why bother with God if our rational nature in the end means we'll gravitate to the good and God? Hart's only answer appears to be we'll get there quicker and have less pain if we work with Jesus and the Spirit. But the point is, it's our natural rationality that enables our salvation. So there's not really an awful lot of God's grace that we see shot through the New Testament and the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And then a fourth challenge for Hart, fourth but not exhaustively, is his view of evil. He seems to suggest that evil is not in the human rational being as such, and thus there cannot be in principle any kind of um, making evil a habit for the human being, only becoming having a habit of good. And putting aside the fact that Hart can't really explain the fall on this account, the biblical texts in our experience suggest we certainly can make evil a habit. In the book of Exodus, Pharaoh refuses to listen to Moses' pleas to let his people go, and the Egyptians suffer dire consequences. But this does not result in Pharaoh's rational nature gradually shifting him towards the right and the good. On the contrary, his heart is further hardened. Or, or a more recent example, Joseph Stalin, who once entertained the prospect of becoming a priest, but whose last gesture on his deathbed, according to his daughter, was to wave his fist at the Almighty. Other biblical and contemporary examples are not hard to come by. And I could go on, but I've spent some time on Hart as he is the most recent author I know propounding universalism, and it is fashionable. But you need to know, if you're advocating this approach, that there are challenges to it. And if you really want a good account of the challenges, a detailed consideration, a history of Christian universalism, you might want to try the thousand page plus two volume work by Michael McClimmond entitled The Devil's Redemption. But now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you have all been waiting for. Yes. What does the Church of England say? Drum roll. Well, if we go back to uh, the early days of the Church of England, 1553, in the 1553 prayer book, it said, all men shall not be saved at length. Again, forgive the sexism, this was a, a creature of its time. So in 1553, the prayer book shut to the door on universalism. So it must have gone for either annihilation or uh, 
eternal torment. But, ladies and gentlemen, in the final version, because th that was in the 42 articles of the 1553 prayer book, in the final version, that phrase was omitted from the 39 articles that we actually have inherited in the Book of Common Prayer. So the Church of England at that stage leaves the door open for God's redeeming power. All of us may, may at length be saved. So that's what we find in the prayer book. Now, the most recent statement I know on this, and I stand to be corrected, is from 1995. And that's The Mystery of Salvation, which is which is a, a tome that's certainly worth reading if, you, if you're interested in this and related topics, uh, which is by the Doctrine Commission of the Church of England. And what that asserts is the following. It is our conviction that the reality of hell and indeed of heaven is the ultimate affirmation of human freedom. Hell is not eternal torment, but it is the final and irreversible choosing of that which is opposed to God so completely and so absolutely that the only end is total non-being. Hmm. So in terms of the three options I gave you earlier, they're saying no to eternal torment, but they're saying no by the looks of things to universalism too. They're actually going for annihilation, aren't they? The only end is total non-being. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll see that indeed they are not going for universalism because as they say later, dogmatic universalism contradicts the very nature of human love. Love cannot compel the surrender of a single heart that holds out against it. Love never forces. So that was 1995. But what are some recent Anglican theologians saying? Well, I, I, I take as a kind of like a weather vane on this Tom Wright. And Tom Wright follows suit with the uh, idea of annihilation, writing, for instance, this. Uh, that those who have refused and rejected uh, God in this life after death, they become at last by their own effective choice beings that once were human but now are not, creatures that have ceased to, to bear the divine image at all. With the death of that body in which they inhabited God's good world, in which the flickering flame of goodness had not been completely snuffed out, they pass simultaneously beyond hope, but also beyond pity. So for Wright, there is a, a kind of, uh, these are no longer human creatures uh, because of their habituation to evil and wickedness. And eventually they peter out uh, as they are completely uh, separated from the source of life. Hmm. So Wright has been speculating. The Church of England Doctrine Commission has been speculating, so I, I hope you don't mind if I have a quick speculate and then you can have a discussion and speculate yourselves. So, is there a way in which we can understand hell that retains the stress universalism has on God's love, but also takes into account the scriptural range of statements about eternal torment. Remembering that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he died for us, so is not in any shape or form looking to exclude or damn us. Well, I think there is a way of squaring the circle on this. And hell, if nothing else, means separation from God a partners from God. If Joseph Stalin is anything to go by, some people apparently really do not want to be with God. And indeed, in this life, there are, it appears, some people who really do not want to be around truth, goodness and beauty and the things of God. So maybe take this as an idea that hell is God's best for some people that hell is God's best for some people. 
It's the best God can do for those who really, really do not want to be with God. The worst would be to make them be with God. Now, what that means is separation from God, because people in hell want to be away from God and God allows it. On this account, hell is not something that God enjoys or savours. God is not willing that anyone should be apart from him. Of course not. He comes in the form of a baby in a manger in order to woo us because he is besotted with us. His desire is that we should come to everlasting life with him. That is his wish. God is not trying to keep people out of the kingdom of God, but trying to get them in. Some people think that God has his foot against the door, unwilling to let people in. No, God is willing, really willing. But the issue is, do we want to be there? And what's more, could we stand it if we were? If we made it, would it be heaven for us? Or would it be something rather different? If we get there and find we really don't like this God, this truth, this goodness, this beauty, that could be a problem because in the kingdom of God, we are going to be right up against God constantly, forever. And people who really, really have taken again God might find that to be utterly agonising. I like what Uncle Otis said. Uncle Otis is a faith healing evangelist, long dead. When asked who goes to heaven would answer something like everyone who can stand that much love. And when asked who goes to hell, responds, only those who will have it no other way. Which echoes what C.S. Lewis said. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. On this account, Lewis says, God treats human beings with so much dignity that God allows them to make choices and then bear the consequences of those choices. What this is suggesting is that for some people, being with God is the worst thing that could possibly happen to them. So what I'm saying is Jesus was constantly trying to enfold people into his kingdom, not trying to send people to hell, trying to get as many people into the kingdom as he could. And this is what God's heart is. God does not create hell because God's mad or because God wants to see people suffer or because God enjoys torturing people for eternity. The only reason for a hell is because God makes provision, provision for what people want. And hell is simply the best God can do for some people. And you might say, well, once people have experienced hell, wouldn't they want out? But if people are there because they can't stomach God, what is going to make them want to love God? What we call the punishment of separation is not a punishment for them, presumably, but a preference. I like what Dallas Willard said. Hell is not an oops or a slip. One does not miss heaven by a hair, but by a constant effort to avoid and escape God. That seems right to me. Hell doesn't happen because we didn't read the small print. Hell is a determined direction and course of action. Now, happy for you to disagree, but it seems to me that this view does do the honour to the God who is love and does justice to the awesome responsibility we have as free human beings. And you might still ask, but why, if this view is correct, are there all the allusions to the weeping and gnashing of teeth? And my suggestion about this is that could be about perspective. Recall the story of Achilles and the tortoise, where Achilles is racing the tortoise and Achilles notices that he halves the distance between him and the tortoise every while. But if he's only ever halving the distance, he'll never get to the tortoise. Whereas from a spectator's point of view, Achilles catches up and overtakes the tortoise. You see the different perspectives and the conclusions drawn. 
for those gazing in bliss upon our Lord and delighting in partnership with our Lord, their view of those separated from this source of delight can only be pictured in terms of dire loss, remorse and pain, weeping and wailing, regret and gnashing of teeth. Meanwhile, from the perspective of those so separated, it might look rather different. Who's to say, as the goats go away in Matthew 25, they aren't saying, what stupid ideas Jesus the judge has. Ridiculous. Serving those in prison, prisoners got what they deserved. Clothing the naked, they got themselves in that state. The sick, like, I'm going to put me and mine at risk of infection. And we know from the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, if you follow Kenneth Bailey's explanation of that parable, even in Hades, the rich man continues to be unrepentant, racist, self-indulgent and regarding of Lazarus as an inferior who should serve him as a waiter and an errand boy. And the rich man's agony is about his own immediate desires being assuaged locked into the unending tyranny of satisfying his own immediate desires and his self-serving agenda. But from his point of view, this is preferable to letting go of his self-serving agenda. Perhaps as Albert Camus said, in the end, some will prefer to rebel against the universe as God has constructed it, turning their backs on God in favour of a universe as he or she prefers it to be. So that is a speculation to try and bring together these, these possibilities and the diversity of scripture on all of this. But in all of this, we still, as an imperative as Christians, need to hope and pray for the salvation of all, that hell is finally empty. I would suggest that Christian love demands that we are hopeful about the scope of salvation in God's loving purposes, because this is what God desires. But we can make no presumption about the population level in hell. We hope for each person, a hope that begins from the standpoint of God's gracious purposes towards each and every person, and we should seek to work with God on this, whether by example, with acts of service, prayer, efforts in evangelism, and so on. When Jesus was asked, Lord, will those who are saved be few? What does he say? He says, strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Jesus doesn't answer the question. His response doesn't tell us the numbers of those being saved, but his words do tell us we need to be taking the teaching and the way of Jesus seriously ourselves and seeking as far as possible to open this way to others. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, an opportunity now for you to discuss amongst yourselves, because I have rabbited on for some time. So I'm going to put you into uh, some breakout rooms. And I look forward to seeing you in about 10 to 15 minutes. Right, okay. Okay, so what have I done? 